Welcome to Curious Live. I'm Dr. Alfredo Carpinetti, the Senior Space Correspondent for IFL Science. We're about to go on a journey through the galaxy to discover beautiful and strange distant worlds, worlds where alien life might have evolved. Our guide on this journey is Professor Lisa Kaltenegger from Cornell University and author of the book, Alien Earths. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Professor, can you tell us a bit about your unique background and how straddling two fields uh, has informed uh, your search, uh, your work in search for life uh, elsewhere in the universe? I am Austrian, so I grew up in a tiny town in Austria, and then I went to university. And there I decided to uh, try to go to one of these international meetings and it happened to be in Corsica. And it was on a topic I was just fascinated by, new worlds around other stars. And that meeting changed kind of everything. And what I've learned is that it takes thousand ideas, lots of different opinions, lots of different ideas, lots of different backgrounds to find solution to these big questions of how to find life in the universe. A lot of our search for alien life depends on our, and capital O, understanding of life. So how do we define life on Earth? And how does that definition impact how we look for it elsewhere? One of the fun things about my research was also to dive into the question, what is life? And what's really interesting is that a while back, Schrodinger, so he was a physicist and Austrian Nobel Prize winner, was actually coming up with this idea what it would have to take for life to work. That was way before we knew the DNA worked. And it actually inspired uh, Watson and Crick to get the DNA structure. They read that book. And so little by little, we finding out what life is, how we define life. And the best definition we have right now is that life undergoes, uh, it is a physical system, right? Mm -hmm. It is an enclosed physical system. What that just means is you have like a membrane or kind of cellular structure. And the key point there is that you want to be able to concentrate chemistry. Because if you want to make something like DNA or RNA, and you're like this huge, huge ocean, the water will dilute everything. So you want a kind of vesicle and you want to go with Darwinian evolution. So you want to be able to have, you know, heritage knowledge, basically, that you imply. And so when you take these things together, you're like, OK, good. So let's check. And then you can reproduce. But there we are already starting to get into a slippery slope because there are um, animals that cannot reproduce. They're sterile. And so is that not life? Would we not say that that is life? Of course we would say it's life, but it's kind of really interesting how our best late definition starts to come up to these special cases where it breaks down. And then another question is, well, what about fire, right? It takes nutrition in or like wood in. It actually seems it moves, you know, it could evolve, right? It grows, but it doesn't give information to like the next tiny fire that it spawns. But then what about a computer virus for an astronomer? Actually, if there's a tiny thing that moves on the surface of a planet, it's not going to help me if the planet is around a different star far, far, far away. So I need a biosphere that changes the air or the surface of the planet in a major way. And so think about outside, you have the green grass, the, the forest, you know, the color of our world. And also, of course, the oxygen we breathe. And then some of the methane is made by life. And so what astronomers are looking for is in a way, also a little bit divorced from this fundamental, how could we define any life, any tiny structure that qualifies a life. But currently we need huge signs of life to spot it over cosmic distances. But on our own planet, life does that. The biosphere changed our planet completely several times. So when we look at another world, 
there are things we can look for and spot that would tell us if anything's breathing there too. So what are the key characteristics uh, that we look for in habitable exoplanets? How do we define uh, that a uh, exoplanet could be habitable? And uh, how do astronomers differentiate uh, between those that uh, seems like a, a good bet for habitability and those that we definitely know that cannot have uh, life? The mm -hmm. Earth is our ground truth, our Rosetta Stone, if you like. And so we're looking at the Earth, and there was a Galileo mission that in 1993, it was it went to Jupiter, so it was about to explore Jupiter, but it had a flyby, so it took some energy from its path around the Earth to go like faster and further to Jupiter. And at that time, Carl Sagan, uh, who was an astronomer, a very well-known astronomer here in the U.S., and I'm actually sitting in his office right now, having the same view outside. Uh, but basically, he used that telescope or that satellite to look back at the Earth and say, look, we need to be able to find life on the Earth, just as a test case. And so when he analyzed the Earth, the combination of oxygen with a reducing gas like methane, because oxygen plus methane makes CO2 and water in the long run. So if you still see oxygen when there's still methane there, that means both are produced in big quantities right now. And for methane, it could also be geology, but for oxygen, we have no other explanation than life. So at a certain distance from the star, it's too hot, then it gets warm, and then it's too cold. It's like when you stand around a huge bonfire, right? There's mm -hmm. just the right distance where it's warm. And that distance is what we call the habitable zone, or you might have heard about it as a Goldilocks zone in the press. It's basically where if you plop an earth there, so a planet, a rock like the earth with water, the water on the surface would be liquid and it would give you oceans and rivers. And so does that mean there's only life that can live there? Actually, it doesn't. Because if you freeze things over, there could be a subsurface ocean, like we hope on the icy moons in our solar system. We hope that the subsurface oceans could have our life. But we don't know. We have to go there, drill in the ice, and check. This is why this habitable sound, where you could have liquid water on the surface, liquid water that doesn't block any gases life in the oceans would make from coming up and changing the atmosphere, and also it should enable life to actually come and go to the surface and thus color the surface with its pigments. On Earth, uh, in those kind of environments and uh, in many other environments, we find um, this um, organism we call extremophiles that can survive uh, all those extreme conditions that uh, we certainly cannot. Uh, how important is to... Um, understand those uh, um, those extremophiles, uh, those uh, those um, creatures that really push us, uh, our definition of the comfortable zone for life. A key question that we don't have an answer to is can life start as an extreme organism or under mm. these extreme conditions? Because if it can, then you have now opened the habitable sound to so much wider uh, conditions. It doesn't have to be just like, you know, nicely warm conditions on the surface. It could be like crazy hot and crazy cold. And you still know of life that could survive there. Some people have strong opinions that they think you need to have temperate conditions. And then life shows how incredible good it is to adapt to any kind of environment it finds itself in. So that's fascinating. And this is also why it's so important to actually study these extremophiles because you don't want to say, oh, I'm going to not look at this planet because there couldn't be any life, right? And there's like life on our planet in the niche that basically is like that planet that I see a bit too hot, a bit too acid, for example. And I was like, oh, I'm not going to look. I was like, no, 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 no. Don't have blinders on right? Because often for us, it's the easiest to think about you and me in our search for life, or green plants and animals, things that we encounter every day. But life is so much more diverse, and so much more tenacious, 
And that is also the beauty of this research to me. We are pushing, finding what the real limits for life are, when the chains of your molecules break down, when the cells disintegrate and cannot um, regulate the chemistry anymore so that you can have like an inside and outside. That's when the limits of life as we know it come in. But how life copes on these limits is incredibly insightful to figure out what uh, mechanisms it can evolve to adapt to a kind of really weird planet or a planet that was nice and warm in the beginning and then became like super hot or super cold, whichever direction it goes. And so I love this research because every day I learn something new. And one of the examples that maybe a listener will know is this hardy grate. It's like this tiny, beautiful organism. It's like, you can't see it. It basically lives in a, in a dew drop or in a drop of water. But it is incredible. You can boil it. You can freeze it. They put it on the outside of a rocket and send it to space. And more than half of the tardigrade actually came back. Well, they go into a, a dune state is what we call it. So basically, they shrivel up and get rid of most of the water. And this is why they can actually survive extreme conditions. But then when they come back, like from the rocket, you put some water on them and do, 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 do the starting grass for like unfurl, walk around, lay an egg, everything's fine. If we could figure out how it does that, that would be amazing if we ever considered long space travel. Because it would be great for us to shrivel up not age, and then basically get to another planet. And if there's some water, like somebody drops some water on us, and we're like, okay, we're here now. What are the challenges to that researchers face in developing instruments that are capable of detecting the signature? Um, I know that uh, um, telescopes are getting uh, better and better and getting uh, um, those signature of gases, uh, um, but are we uh, are those telescopes good enough to find those gases on any kind of planet? And can we start spotting those colors? Uh, or are we not there yet? You have two things working against you. Mm -hmm. One is that a planet is very tiny compared to a big, bright star. So if you take the Earth and put it 100 times next to each other, roughly, you have the diameter of the sun. So just imagine this bright, hot sun next to this tiny, dim planet. And you don't even want to see the tiny, dim planet. We do want to see it. But we want to go further than that. We want to actually have a look at the atmosphere, the thin rim around this tiny planet, so the thin gas. And there, the comparison is if you had an apple, mm -hmm. actually the skin of the apple would be thinner than the atmosphere of the Earth in that scale, in the Apple scale. So we're trying to find a tiny, tiny, tiny signal. And then the second thing that works against you is that if you take the sun and you go to the outermost planet, Nep Neptune, right? And then you basically shrink this whole scale to the size of a cookie. The next star over, Proxima Centauri, and basically in that cookie scale, it is 9,000 cookies away. And so there's a trick that astronomer came up with to find these other worlds, these tiny dim worlds around these big bright stars. The first discovery was when they were basically looking at the star and the star moved. It moved towards us and away from us. That's what we call the radio velocity or wobble technique. It just means that if two objects move around each other, they both gravitational pull on the other. So they basically move around the center of mass that they both create in the system. It's a little bit like if you go and walk a dog, if you see somebody leaning back, even if you don't see the dog in a park, right? You know, something is pulling on that person. And so this is how they found the first planet around another star. But most of the planets so far, we've actually found with a different technique. And that is when we looked at the bright star and Every once in a while, ever so slightly, it dims. That is because, by chance, when we look at the star, its planet goes between our line of sight and so blocks out part of the hot, bright surface of that star. 
from our view temporarily. The Earth does this once every year. But while that is happening, part of the light from the star is not just blocked out, part of it gets filtered to the air of the planet and gets to my telescope. And light and matter interact. So you can actually hit it with the right energy to make the structure swing and rotate. And light carries energy. So what that means is that when the light gets filtered in the planetary atmosphere, there is some light that doesn't get all the way to my telescope because it hit a molecule and made it swing and rotate. And by the missing light, I can tell you what the makeup is, the chemical makeup of the air of that planet. We currently have this amazing James Webb Space Telescope up in it basically 6.5 meters, so about four times my size in diameter. And so it can catch enough light from these small rocky worlds at this right distance from the star for us to be able to actually split the light out in its colors and see if there's something missing. And especially at what color of light or wavelengths of light something's missing tells me what molecule the light encountered before it got to me. But it's incredibly hard because remember how far away these other stars are and how small these planets are. And we're not even just looking at the planets. We're looking at this apple skin, right, that sits on top of the planet that carries all that information. There's an incredible system that's called the TRAPPIST-1 system. It is a small red sun, and it has seven Earth-sized planets around it, with three of those being within this habitable zone. So this is currently our focus, and I'm part of the nearest team. It's one of the instruments on the James Webb Space Telescope, where we basically take all the time we can get with this amazing big telescope. And so the question is really, are there signs of life in the atmosphere of those worlds? Because if there were, we only a couple of years away, because we have to add up the signal, to spot them. But even if they were not, we are learning about other rocky worlds in the habitable zone around other suns. If you want to look for pigments, the color of a different world, that's a little further off because there we need to be able to block the light from the star completely and see this tiny planet. And so we need a next generation of telescope that's built to do that, to have a mask that blocks out the bright star and see the other pale blue dot, yellow blue dot, red blue dot. And in my mind, when I think about that, visions unfold. For example, you have an ocean world and you would have like a red algae bloom covering all these oceans and you could see a red world out there. Or you have a jungle world covered in green or whatever you want to imagine. What I want to make sure with the color catalog of life that we create here at Cornell is that we don't miss signs of life if they are there. But it's up to you and to every one of us to imagine how these other worlds could be like. You went so much detail about all the possibility of life beyond uh, our, as you said, our pale blue dots. Uh, and you also intertwine with your own fascinating uh, research journey. Can you tell us a bit about uh, the book and your motivation for writing it? The best way for me is to actually explain this to anyone, because that means I understood it. And this is also where I see where all the puzzle pieces I'm working on, where there are pieces that I might have missed or where I should go into more depth. And it also allowed me a beautiful opportunity just to go into my most favorite sci-fi and try to figure out if these planets could exist, which things could exist and which could not. But the key point for me was, hopefully it's going to make you look up because one out of five stars have a planet in this right distance that's not too hot or not too cold. And that's a rock. And our galaxy alone has 200 billion stars. So they are 
billions and billions of possibilities that we now found or in, are encountering where there could be potentially, we don't know yet, somebody else also looking and wondering if they're alone. Well, I don't think we could uh, finish on a better thought. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us about uh, Alien Arts, uh, with your book, uh, and the many, many, you said one in five uh, in the in the universe, uh, many, many, many worlds there are out there. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.